So winter 23, paper 41. This is live session number six, right? Let's start with the first question. A girl holds a rubber ball out of a window of a tall building. Mass of the ball is this much. The ball is at rest 10 meters above a concrete path. Calculate the GPE of the ball relative to the concrete path. Very straightforward. It's just MGH. Always do write the formula. M is 0.2. G is 9.8. And H is 10. Right, so you just multiply all of these together and that's your answer for the GPE. So that should be 20 joules. Units are not written, so you have to write them yourself. So this is 20 joules. <coughs> the girl releases the ball and it falls towards the path. The ball strikes the path and bounces vertically upwards. 1.1 shows the ball falling towards the path. So we have the ball falling this distance which was for which we calculated the GPE in the previous part and now we need to so now we are given something the speed of the ball immediately before it strikes the path is 14 meters per second the speed of the ball immediately after it strikes the path is 12 meters per second calculate the kinetic energy of the ball immediately after it strikes the concrete path so after means I'll use the speed which is also after the collision. So half mv square, half mass was given as 0.2 kg and the velocity after is 12, so this is 12 squared. So we just plug in these values and we get another answer for the energy which is 14 joules of kinetic energy after the collision. This is also really straightforward. Show that the change in momentum of the ball when it bounces off the path is 5.2 kg meters per second. Now for this, even though this is uh, something very easy for a good candidate who has prepared well the chapter of momentum, let me still talk about this. So when the ball is going to be falling, it's going to hit with a speed of 14 meters per second and it's going to rebound with a speed of 12 meters per second. Now this is the case where we have to find the change in momentum where the direction is also changing. So we need to use the sign convention. What this means is we need to take vectors in one certain direction as positive and vectors in the exact opposite direction will be negative. So let's say this time out I take upwards as positive. This means vectors downwards will be negative, right? So if I now find the change in momentum, so I know change in momentum, like any change is final minus initial. So final momentum would be the mass. So I can write this symbolically like this, mv, mass times final velocity minus mass times initial velocity. Mass was 0.2, you can also see I can factor this out. So m bracket v minus u, v is 12 and it's it's going to be positive because this is upwards, right? So plus 12 minus and u, the initial velocity is going to be negative because it's downwards. So it's going to be minus, minus 14, right? So 12 minus, minus 14. So this is 26 times 0.2 should give you exactly this, which is 5.2 kg meters per second. Right, you should also be familiar that another possible unit of momentum is the Newton second. Right? Ball is in contact with the path for 0.25 seconds. Calculate the average resultant force on the ball when it is in contact with the path. Also really easy. Force is the rate of change of momentum. So 5.2 divided by the 0.25, right? Change in momentum divide by the time during which that change in momentum happened. So this divided by 0.25 is 20.8 newtons or to 2 SF you can also write this as 21 newtons. Alright, so that's the solution to the first question. Question number two. 
A copper cooking pan contains water. 2.1 shows the pan on a hot plate of a cooker. Copper is a metal. The thermal energy is conducted through all solids by lattice vibrations. Describe one other way in which thermal energy is conducted through copper. And you know that this other way is what it is what makes copper a good conductor of electricity. So what do we say here? We know that we have to refer to the free electron movement of particles here. So I'll say that there are free electrons in the copper. So free electrons in copper gain kinetic energy when heated. But again, the idea is that since they are free, since they are not restricted like particles, they can gain the thermal energy and then move to the colder ends, right? So they gain the kinetic energy when heated and electrons move to the colder end and saying this statement which I'm about to write now is really really important in all questions where you have to describe free electron movement and heat transfer because of free electron movement. So this statement is something you need to write always and pass on their energy to the atoms there to the atoms there by collisions. The outside surface of the cooking pan is kept clean by regular polishing. Explain one other advantage of keeping the surface of the pan shiny. So having the surface shiny, what's another advantage of this? So if you have the surface of the pan which is shiny, what would you say? That it blocks off incoming radiation. Is that what you would say? And the answer to that question is no. That's not what you would say. Instead, what you should say is that the radiation which is trying to go out of this body of the pan, this gets reflected inwards. Right? That's what you have to say. So you'll say this, that the outgoing and always whenever you have to use the word radiation, always uh, say infrared with it as well. So the outgoing infrared radiation is reflected back into the pan. since shiny surfaces are good reflectors. So this thing is important. Some people think that they just say that it's a good reflector and then they write some stuff after this. This will give them the mark. That's not how this is going to work. This is equally applicable to O-levels as well as to IGCSE. You need to very clearly say what energy is going to be reflected, right? So it's not some outcoming, uh, some energy which is uh, coming in from the outside, maybe like from the sun or another hot source which is reflected, but it's the energy from inside because of this uh, hot water or whatever it was, the energy of radiation from that is reflected back into the water. So that's what you had to say here. Let's go on. Thermal energy passes into the water through the base of the pan. Identify the main method by which thermal energy is transferred throughout the water. Right? This water, which gets heated up near to the flame, only heats up the base. The question is asking, how is it transferred to all of the water? That's what the examiner will use as words to indicate to you. Or he will say how, it, how all of the water gets heated up. 
to get you thinking about convection right how density changes how hot water rises cold water falls yes exactly amar so when you talk about that that's how you would say that convection happens this is what you need to look out for either throughout the water or how it heats up all the water liquids are difficult to compress whereas gases can be compressed easily explain in terms of particles why is it difficult to compress liquids so in terms of particles so you need to refer to their structures so you know that particles of liquids are very close together are close together with little space in between so strong intermolecular forces prevent compression whenever thinking about compression it's always useful to visualize this as having your particles in a syringe and somebody pre pressing down on that plunger so with gases you can compress them because the spaces between the particles are so much and that's because the intermolecular forces are weak right and similarly in the case of liquids because particles are pretty close together with not much space that you can really squeeze the particles into that's because it has strong intermolecular forces it's not very compressible Three point one shows a rectangular block floating in water. Density of water is thousand kg per meter cube. Area of the base of the block is zero point zero one four meters square. The base of the block is at a depth of zero point zero eight seven meters below the surface of water. Show that the pressure due to the water at the base of the block is approximately this much. So pressure is rho g h, right? Rho is thousand. G is again nine point eight. and h is 0.087 which should give you this now in this case how do i know i do not have to add the atmospheric pressure here because you know that some questions in some questions you know that there are marks for adding the atmospheric pressure well one of the obvious reasons are is that atmospheric pressure is not provided and you are not expected to know a value by heart to add but the real reason is that this says pressure due to the water if it said total pressure then i would have to add the atmospheric pressure similarly if the examiner wants me to just use rho g h he will either say pressure due to the water or he will say the change in pressure here the change in pressure when it goes from the surface down below because the atmospheric pressure will also be acting here will also be acting here so the change in pressure then comes about because of the liquid pressure calculate the force f on the base of the block caused by the pressure given in b1 so now that we know pressure we can use force equals pressure times area right just a rearrange form of uh, pressure equals force over area the definition so from this pressure is 850 pascals area is 0.014 so doing this you get the force as 12 newtons to 2 sf all right next part force f is equal to the weight of the block calculate the mass of the block so w equals mg so this is 12 so mass would just be 12 over 9.8 12 over 9.8 which turns out to be 1.2 kg so some of these questions in igcse are really easy as compared to o levels a radio transmitter is a very tall thin cylinder 
it is prevented from falling over by wires which have one end fixed to the transmitter another end fixed in the ground ends of the wires in the ground are a long distance from the transmitter 4.1 shows the transmitter and two of the wires center of gravity is shown in 4.1 state what is meant by center of gravity again this is, this is a very precise definition this is the only one which is correct anything else does not gain marks so you will say the point through which the entire weight of the object either you say appears or su is supposed to or is taken to act it's not actually the point through which it acts this is just a simplification on our end right so this is what we say that this is the point through which the entire weight appears or is taken or is supposed to act also if for example if the definition was not center of gravity if instead this said center of mass the definition would still be the same right so just keep this in mind explain why the radio transmitter without the wires is a very unstable structure this is a good question not really difficult but you need to know why would this be an unstable structure so you can see it has a very high center of gravity and a very small base area right that's what is going to make it says that even if it's slightly rotated it's going to topple over right this has to do with instability so what makes it unstable so you'll say that because of the high center of gravity and the small base area it would topple over on a small tilt right so even if it is tilted slightly it's uh, it's going to fall off wire w is under tension and it exerts a force t on the transmitter mark an arrow to show the force t exerted by wire w on the transmitter so wire w exerts a force t which is the tension the way tension is marked as is that it's always marked away from the object being considered along the rope right so this is how tension is always marked this transmitter would feel as if it's pulled by the wire towards the ground force t produces a moment on the transmitter about its base describe how the moment produced by t is calculated and, and indicate on 4.1 what is meant by any other terms in the description so it's about its base right i know moment is force times perpendicular distance so this is my pivot right here this is the pivot so how do i now find out a perpendicular distance with the pivot this is something that you really need to think about this is in my opinion the first tricky part of this paper that we have seen so far remember that a force there's something called a line of action of a force along which this entire force can be basically picked up and moved along this line so i can pick up this force and move it all along this line now because all of you also take o level math you know that the perpendicular distance is the shortest distance so where at all like locations of the force along this line where would it be closest to the pivot that's obviously going to be this distance which is going to be the shortest distance all right so this is the distance d that we need so now i'll say that the moment is t times d 
right? Because it asked me to indicate on 4.1 what is meant by the other term. So that's what D is. So D is the perpendicular distance of the force from the pivot, which in this case was the base. The radio transmitter uses radio waves to transmit radio and television programs. State one other use of radio waves. So for radio waves, you have a lot of these uses. One of these uses is, uh, what do you call it? RFID of the top of my head and astronomy, right? And also, by the way, Bluetooth is used by both radio waves, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. So these things, so smooth sailing so far, let's go on. Many methods of generating electrical power involve the use of water. Describe one method of generating electrical energy, electrical power from energy stored in water, right? So I'm thinking hydroelectric. So for hydroelectric, you know that there is a uh, water which is stored behind the dam. So I'm talking about hydroelectric. So you have water from a height hitting the turbine. Now it's important here that you describe what energy transfers are going to take place. So you know that the GPE of the water turns into kinetic energy of the water, which is then transferred to kinetic energy of the turbine because it makes the turbine spin which then becomes electrical energy in the generator. In a way, you have to just describe this in so many words here uh, in your description. I've just made a pretty comprehensive block diagram which is going to, which captures all of this information. Right? So you should just write this out in words that the, because it falls from a height, so it has gravitational potential energy. As it falls, it turns into kinetic energy of the water. When it hits the turbine, when it makes the turbine turn, so the turbine has kinetic energy, and then the turbine drives the generator, which creates electrical energy. Right? For this method, you chose an A state, one advantage and one disadvantage of ge generating electricity this way. So advantage is obviously that it's renewable, right? It's not going to run out anytime soon, hydroelectric power. And the disadvantage of generating electricity from energy stored in the water. So what's the disadvantage of hydroelectric power? Be very precise about this. So building dams is costly to store the water. Or you can also add to that uh, natural landscape argument that dams ruin the natural landscape. State two methods of generating electrical power for which the main source of energy is not the sun. So in my mind, I'm first thinking nuclear energy, right? For nuclear energy, the main energy source is not the sun. It's the uranium source that we have. And then I'm thinking maybe like tidal because tidal is because of the tides in the sea, which is because of the moon and not really the sun. All right. Let's go on.
A page of printed text is placed 18 centimeters from a converging lens of focal length 35 centimeters. So it's important to note the scale here as well. So each box basically is one centimeters, right? So one, two, three, four, five. So that's five centimeters. 6.1 is a scale diagram of the arrangement with each of the two principal focuses, focal points of the lens labeled F. So you have one here, you have another one here. This is the optical center. So this is O of the lens. So this is, uh, if you look here, it's placed between O and F. I hope you guys see this. This is the focal lens, this is O, this is F. So it's placed between O and F. A length of 1 cm on the scale diagram represents an actual length of 5 cm. So we've just talked about this. By drawing on 6.1, locate the image of the page produced by the lens and label it I. Right, so if we go on to do this, so we know that one of the easier ways to, one of the easier rules to make the lens image is to first draw this one. Right, which is that a ray which is drawn from an image and if it goes through the optical center, it's undeviated. So let me stretch it here in this direction as well. Because I don't know how much I'll need to use. All right, so it's this image, right? This is how the image goes. And by the way, if I remember my lens cases properly, I know that this is going to form a virtual image. So in fact, this one, I should have really drawn as dotted lines because this is not a real ray, right? It's going to form a virtual image. This is going behind the object itself. This is not a real ray. This is a virtual ray, which should then be drawn as a dotted line. The other way uh, to draw the other ray is to make it like this. Let's do another color for this one. So a ray which is drawn like this. Actually, let's try again. So a ray which is drawn parallel to the principal axis. This is refracted. It bends so that it now passes through F. Right, so this is my ray which comes like this and like this. And now again, because I knew and that's what I'm also getting here, I know that this image so I know that this is going to give rise to a virtual image so I need to take this ray back now All right, so I see both of these crossing over at this point right here. So this is going to be the formation of my image. Which happens here, right? So this is my image, all right? So locate the image of the page produced by the lens, label it I. So this is our image, I. All right, so this is how we draw those uh, lens diagrams. So the intersection is labeled I. Using 6.1, determine the actual distance of image I from the lens. So for this, we'll just need to use the scale here. So we know that this is so from the center, if we start to count, my image is more like somewhere here. All 
All right, so this is slightly after 35. This is like 36, right? So yes, now my answer makes sense. So this is 36 centimeters. All right, this is what I get. Again, make sure that whenever you make these rays, like all of these rays which are going behind the lens, the ones which I make them, the ones which I make come back. So all of this part, all of this part should be dotted. All right, this should be dotted. Converging lenses can be used as magnifying glasses. State whether the image produced when the lens is used as a magnifying glass is real or virtual. Explain why. So if you think about a magnifying glass, this is by the way the application of what I taught you guys as K6 of lenses, right? So this is really K6 of lenses. You do know that for a magnifying glass, the image formed is virtual. How do you explain this? Well, you can talk about this really in one of two ways. You can say this is virtual because this cannot be captured on a screen. Or you can say that the rays just appear to come from a point, right? So they don't actually come from a point, they just appear to come from a point. Suggest how someone is long-sighted may benefit from using a converging lens. So if you have someone who is long-sighted, so the idea is that for a long-sighted person, let me draw this. This is where the image is supposed to be formed. And for a long-sighted person, the image forms a long distance from the retina. This is the retina. So it forms at an image like, it converges here. So somewhere at the back is where it would converge. So how would you say that this, uh, how would you say this is remedied? Is so you will say that long-sightedness forms image behind the retina. So a converging lens makes the rays converge on the retina. So this time out the image would now with the help of the converging lens it would be converging right on the retina. Let's go on. A plastic rod is uncharged when the rod is rubbed with a woolen cloth the rod becomes negatively charged explain in terms of particles why the rod becomes negatively charged for it to become negatively charged it must have gained electrons the rod is what i'm talking about it must have gained electrons which are lost by the woolen cloth Right? This is what must have happened here. <coughs> 7.1 shows a negatively charged metal sphere S. There is an electric field surrounding S. State what is meant by an electric field. So a region in space where a charge experiences a force. A gravitational field where a mass experiences a force. A magnetic field where a pole experiences a force. So all fields are basically force fields where particles experience forces. But in each field the difference is what is that property of the object which causes it to experience a force. In the case of a gravitational field it's a mass. In the case of an electric field it's the charge. In the case of a magnetic field it's the uh, pole, right? Draw the pattern of the electric field surrounding sphere S and indicate its direction. 
So again, this is a case where you have like a where you have charge which is basically basically on a body on a spherical conductor. Yeah. So that's the term on a spherical conductor. So you now need to draw the field lines. You know that field lines always go out from the positive one. It's going to appear to be coming in to this negatively charged body. So I just need to make a few of these. And because this is a negatively charged body, the electric field lines would be inwards to here. So this is what we call a radial field, right? So this is what the field looks like here. 7.2 shows a small negative charge near to sphere S. Charge Z experiences a force due to the electric field surrounding S. On 7.2, draw an arrow to show the direction of this force on Z. Remember that electric field lines are always drawn from the perspective of positive charges. In the case of a negative sphere, why is the field line inwards? You can understand this very easily once you know and once you remember that electric fields are drawn from the perspective of positive charges. That small positive charge would be attracted by this negative charge which is why it would move in. So an electric field line shows the direction of force on a positive particle. Similarly, in the case of a positively charged sphere, the electric field lines would be outwards which show that the positively charged, po the, that test positive charge would be repelled by that positive conducting sphere, right? Now, because here we have a negatively charged particle, the direction of the force here would be opposite to what the electric field line shows. So this is also negatively charged. This is also negatively charged. I know this one would be repelled. So this is what the direction of the force would be, right? The electric field line, as I just drew, was inwards, but the direction of the force is opposite to that because this is negatively charged. So this was also a good question. It actually covered all of the concepts related to electric fields in one question. A cylinder is made of modeling clay. The modeling clay is an electrical conductor. 8.1 shows the cylinder, so it's a cross-sectional area, has some length. The cylinder is connected into a circuit. 8.2 shows the circuit also includes a battery of EMF 9 volts and a resistor P. Resistance of P is given, current in P is given. So we can find the voltage across P as well, right? Calculate the magnitude X of the charge that flows through P in 600 seconds. So I know that current is the rate of flow of charge. So for the charge which flows, I can just do IT. So 1.5 amperes in 600 seconds. So this would be what? 900? So you have 900 coulombs of charge which goes through. All right. Next part the resistance of the cylinder of modeling clay. So for the resistance of the cylinder, so I know that if there is a nine volt uh, EMF here, it leads to a current of 1.5 amperes. So using this idea, I can first calculate the effective resistance, the total resistance. So RT, the total resistance would be V over I, but this, is, this would be for the entire circuit. So 9 volts is the EMF of that entire circuit divided by 1.5. So this turns out to be 6 ohms. And since this is a series circuit, I know that the resistance would be the sums of the resistance of P and the cylinder. I know the resistance of P is 4 ohms, so 6 minus 4. The resistance of the cylinder is 2 ohms. All right. Actually, I should write it like 2.0 ohms, 2SF.
The cylinder is removed from the circuit and replaced with a new cylinder made of the same modeling clay. The new cylinder is twice the length, half the cross-sectional area of the first cylinder. Calculate the time that it now takes for a charge of magnitude x to flow through resistor P. So finally, another difficult question. So the new cylinder is twice the length and half the cross-sectional area. What do I do with this information? So I know this idea that resistance is proportional to length and inversely proportional to area, right? So if the length has doubled, the resistance will also double. And because the area has halved, because of that inverse proportion, resist resistance will double again. So the resistance of the new cylinder is going to be four times that previous resistance. So it's going to be four times two, which is eight ohms. Once we do know the new resistance, we are now expected to find the time that it now takes for a charge of magnitude X to flow through P. So this is the magnitude X that we found out, right? And we need to find the time. So for the time, obviously, we would also need the current. So with this new resistance value, we first need to find out the current, right? So V equals IR, so I equals V over the total resistance. So V, the EMF was 9 volts. And now the total resistance is still going to be the uh, series combination of both of these. But now it's going to be 4, the resistance of resistor P. 4 plus the new resistance, which is 8, right? So this is going to be 4 plus 8 this time out. So this is 9 over 12, which is 0.75 amperes. I also know the EMF, uh, sorry, the charge X was 900 coulombs, which is really my Q. So I can now also find out the time it takes. So Q equals I T. So T equals Q over I. So Q is 900 divided by 0 0.75, which is 1200 seconds. Many household smoke alarms contain a sample of the radioactive isotope americium-241. Americium-241 is the isotope of the element em americium that has the nucleon number 241. State how the composition of a nucleus of americium-241 differs from that of a nucleus of americium-242. So both of these are americium, right? So they are isotopes. And the one which has uh, a greater nu nucleon number would have it because of a greater number of neutrons. Protons have to be the same because these are isotopes. So americium-242 has one more neutron. Then americium-241. An atom of a different element has a nucleon number 241. State two differences between the composition of a nucleus of this atom and a nucleus of americium 241. So the obvious one is that since it's a different element, they will have different proton numbers. But it has the same nucleon number. So you know the nucleon number is the number of neutrons plus the number of protons, right? So for it to still have the same number of nucleons, the number of neutrons would also be different, right? This is also really easy. So also a different number of neutrons. All right? Does this make sense? Because their sum is the nucleon number, right? That's the same thing for both of them. 
but you know obviously the proton number is going to be different could be more could be less so if the proton number is different for the total to still be the same this will also be more or less now this is obvious to see that if the proton number is more here then the neutron number of neutrons would be less and vice versa for the total to be the same americium 241 decays to an isotope of neptunium by alpha particle emission complete the equation for this decay so we know alpha is 42 right now we use conservation of proton number conservation of nucleon number so 93 plus 2 must equal this which is 95 similarly 241 equals x plus 4 so 241 minus 4 this is 237 One reason for using an isotope that emits alpha particles in a smoke smoke detector is that alpha particles are more strongly ionizing than beta particles. Explain why alpha particles are more strongly ionizing than beta particles. This is something which is only IGCSE exclusive. So if you are an O level student, just close your ears and eyes. For an alpha particle, the ionization power depends on two things, which is its kinetic energy. and its charge right it depends on these two things so how would you explain this is basically alpha particles have more kinetic energy because they have a greater mass right now you might be thinking that kinetic energy is half mv square so there's both of these things but its mass is so much larger that it offsets its lower speed so alpha particles have more kinetic energy and a greater charge and if either of these things go up your ionization power will also go up right so these are the two factors which affect uh, the ionization power isotope of neptunium produced by americium 241 is also radioactive decay of this isotope of neptunium produces an isotope of protactinium which decays by beta emission beta particles are more penetrating than alpha particles this is a fact half life of neptunium is longer than 2 million years using this information explain the advantage of this long half life for the use and safe disposal of a household smoke alarm so a smoke alarm produces neptunium right that contains a americium which produces a neptunium and when this neptunium isotope decays this produces protactinium no just a second yes it does produce protactinium and half life of neptunium is longer than 2 million years using this information explain the advantage of this long half life for the use and safe disposal of a household smoke alarm So one of the obvious things is that since neptunium has such a long half life it's going to take very long to decay right this is the obvious one so a long half life of neptunium means slower decay or you can say uh less emissions per unit time so this is less hazardous than so this makes it less hazardous and easier to dispose of all right so that's the reasoning here all right the milky way is one of many billions of galaxies each galaxy can contains many billions of stable stars stable stars stands for energy into space by emitting em radiation from their surfaces describe what happens in the core of a stable star to release energy that is eventually transferred into space so you know that nuclear fusion is what powers stars 
and in that you have hydrogen nuclei fusing to produce helium which emits energy which produces energy in a nuclear fusion reaction. Right? So you say hydrogen nuclei and you talk about how this fuses into helium and you use the word nuclear fusion, this is what gets you three marks. In IGCSE, at least, this is my personal opinion, maybe the grading, uh, the grading criteria is a bit funny in a way that it's not really very obvious where you get each mark for, right? So you use these words, hydrogen nuclei and fusing into helium. This gets you two marks. And for any mention of nuclear fusion or nuclear reaction, any word related to that, so you get the third one, right? So it's a bit funny in IGCSE. On the Earth, light from a distant galaxy is observed and analyzed by astronomers. This information is used to determine the speed at which the galaxy is moving away from the Earth. Describe how the observed light is different from when it was emitted. Again, this is a part both OL students and IG students need to know that the observed light we say is red shifted. Or we can see there is an increase in wavelength of this observed light. as compared to the light on Earth. Or we say that the light is red shifted or you can say it appears redder, or you can say it's shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. All of these mean the same thing. State the quantity that astronomers use to determine the speed at which the galaxy is moving away. Again, this is something that O-level students do not need to know. IGCSE students do need to know. How do you find the speed at which the galaxy is uh, receding, how it's going away? is using the change in wavelength. All right. So this is how you find it. The distance, similarly, another popular question which is also asked by GCSE students is how do you find the distance of a galaxy uh, from the Earth? And the answer to that is uh, the luminosity the brightness of certain uh, supernovas or any certain uh, stars, right? So you use the brightness of a supernova to find out how far you are from that certain galaxy. So then you get the speed and then you also get the distance of that galaxy. Again, last part, O levels, guys, you don't have to concern yourselves with this. Hubble constant H naught is this 2.2 into 10 to the negative 18 per second. Calculate the distance from the Earth of a galaxy that is moving away at a speed of this much. So the equation is this, V equals to H naught D, right? We need the distance, so that's V over H naught. So it's just uh, a matter of plugging all of this into your calculator. So V is 1.3 into 10 to the seven H naught is given. So using this, you find uh, the answer as 5.9 into 10 to the 24 meters. Finding the age of the universe, so the age is calculated by just taking the reciprocal of H naught. IGCSE students also need to know why uh, the expression works like this. Why is the age 1 over H naught? That's not anyway what you have to do here. So just one over this thing. 
So this turns out to be 4.5 into 10 to the 17 seconds. This is asked in years. So how do you convert this to years then? So you just need to uh, do division by how many seconds are there in one year. So one year has 365 days. Each day has 24 hours. Each hour has 60 minutes and each minute has 60 seconds. So you just divide by this thing then. So 2.2 into 10 to the negative 18 inverse over 365 times 24 times 3600. So you get 1.44 into 10 to the 10 years, which is really uh, 14 billion years.